Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the human papillomavirus entry mechanism. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing a little bit of biochemistry and we're trying to fathom what is meant by this term, heparan sulfate proteoglycans. And in order to understand this term, we need to know what is heparan sulfate. Now, heparan sulfate is an example of a type of polysaccharide known as a glycosaminoglycan. And glycosaminoglycans, they are polymers of disaccharides that all have this basic form that I've drawn here in blue. They all consist of a uronic acid sugar glycosidically bound to an amino sugar. So you make loads of disaccharides of this form, a uronic acid sugar bound to an amino sugar, polymerize them together, and that polysaccharide will be called glycosaminoglycan. Now, important to understand is the fact that the disaccharides in each of the different positions along the polysaccharide do not need to be the same type. So it's mixed. They just have to be of this same basic form, a uronic acid sugar bound to an amino sugar. Okay, so we've now been through some examples of uronic acid sugars, the two major examples, which are glucuronic acid, by which we strictly mean beta-D-glucuronic acid, and iduronic acid, by which we strictly mean alpha-L-iduronic acid. However, we've discussed that these two forms are the major forms of these molecules, and therefore we often just call them by these shorter names. Now let's go through some examples of amino sugars, which they can be glycosidically linked to to make these disaccharides out of which we will construct glycosaminoglycans. Okay, so there are again two examples of amino sugars that you can use in these disaccharides. And the first one, which we'll go through, is glucosamine, which is an amino sugar derived from glucose. The second one that we'll go through is galactosamine which of course is an amino sugar derived from galactose. And again, with both of these molecules, there are strictly speaking four different forms of the molecule. However, there is one that is most prevalent in human biology, and therefore uh, we refer to that one merely by the short name. So let's start off with glucosamine. So to understand glucosamine, it's actually useful to talk first about the structure of glucose because glucosamine and the four different types of glucosamine completely correspond with the four different types of glucose. So let's firstly discuss the structure of glucose. And again, for galactosamine, we'll firstly discuss the structure of galactose. So glucose then, we'll draw its structure up here in orange. So again, it's going to have a six-membered ring with an oxygen up at the top, like so. And we're now not talking about uronic acid sugars anymore, so the sixth carbon is no longer going to be in a carboxylic acid group. Instead, it's going to be um, with an alcohol group on it instead. Now, I'll give something away right now. The major form of glucose, which we mean when we just say glucose, is actually strictly called alpha D glucose. And that hopefully now allows you to tell me which way the sixth carbon is going to come. So it's going to come out of the page towards us because of course that's what the D tells us. If it was going into the page away from us then that would be L. So here comes the sixth carbon, so there it is, and it's going to have two hydrogens bound to it, so CH2, and then an alcohol group, so CH2OH. And then, of course, the other group coming off that fifth carbon will be a hydrogen, and that will be going into the page away from us. Now, coming round onto the fourth carbon down here, its alcohol group will be going into the page away from us, and the hydrogen will be coming out of the page towards us in this alpha D glucose. The third carbon will have the alcohol group coming out of the page towards us, like so. And, oops, ooh, that's, I'm just going to rewrite that alcohol group. It's not very clear at all. There we go, that's slightly better. Uh, of the second carbon, the alcohol group will be going into the page away from us. And off the anomeric carbon, we we're talking about alpha D glucose, so that means that the anomeric carbon, its alcohol group is going to be going in the opposite way to the sixth carbon. So it needs to be going into the page away from us because the sixth carbon is coming out of the page 
uh, towards us. Okay, so this is the major form of glucose, alpha D glucose. This is the one that is most important in human biology. This is the one when people just say glucose, this is the molecule they mean. However, strictly speaking, there are four different forms of glucose. Let's just go through those. So to create beta D glucose, what would you have to do? The anomeric carbon's orientation would have to change. The, this alcohol group would have to come out of the page towards us, the same as the sixth carbon. That would be beta D glucose, which is very important in plant biology. So it's important as well in biology, but alpha D glucose is more important. So that's the one that gets the name glucose. Okay, um, next, um, let's talk about the L glucose forms. So uh, if we wanted alpha L glucose, what would we have to do? We'd have to take the exact mirror image of this. So we'd have to just swap around the orientation of all five of those bonds. If we wanted beta L glucose, we'd have to swap around all the orientation of these four bonds, but we'd leave this one unchanged. Okay, so those are the four different forms of glucose. Now, the L glucose forms are not important at all, um, but the beta D glucose is an important molecule in biology. It's just alpha D glucose is more important in human biology, so it's the one that gets the name glucose. Now, of course, glucose was only a way of discussing glucosamine, so let's now talk about glucosamine. To turn a glucose molecule into a glucosamine, you target this alcohol group here. So glucosamine is going to have an amino group, as the name implies. So take that alcohol group off and replace it with an amino group. Have it going in the same orientation as the alcohol group, and that is glucosamine. So the major form of glucosamine is, strictly speaking, alpha D glucosamine, corresponding exactly to alpha D glucose. So this exact molecule I've drawn here, take that alcohol group off, put an amino group there going into the page away from us, that is alpha D glucosamine, and that's the major form of glucosamine. So the major form of glucose and the major form of glucosamine utterly uh, coincide. Again, there are four different forms of glucosamine, and they correspond perfectly to the four different forms of glucose. So, to get beta D glucosamine, you'd move this one to coming out of the page towards us. To get alpha L glucosamine, you'd swap every single one of the five around. To get beta L glucosamine, you'd swap these four around. So, you'd have the amino group then coming out of the page towards us. But the major form of glucosamine is alpha D glucosamine, and we just usually call that glucosamine. So by glucosamine we mean this molecule that I have now drawn here with the alcohol group crossed out and amino group there instead. Okay, so that's the structure of glucosamine, one of the examples of an amino sugar that you can have bound to the uronic acid sugar. Now let's do galactosamine. So again, uh, to discuss galactosamine, it's useful to firstly discuss the structure of galactose. Now, galactose is another monosaccharide. It's very, very similar to glucose. It's an optical isomer of glucose. Okay, so let's draw this here. So again, we'll start off with the six-membered ring here. There's the oxygen. And here are the five carbons, like so. Now, uh, the major form of galactose is going to be beta D galactose. And again, galactose is not a uronic acid, so the sixth carbon is going to have an alcohol group off it. And it's going to be coming out of the page towards us because, again, the major form is beta-D galactose, not an L form. So here is the sixth carbon, CH2OH there. Now, coming round then onto the fourth carbon, the alcohol group is now not going to be going into the page away from us. In beta-D galactose, this is one of the major changes here, the alcohol group is going to be coming out of the page towards us. This is one of the true things that distinguishes glucose from galactose. This alcohol group is now going to be coming out of the page towards us. Then the second and third carbons are going to be the same, so the alcohol group off the third is going to be coming out of the page towards us. On the second, it's going to be coming into the page uh, away, away from us, and 
Uh, finally, on the animeric carbon, we're talking about beta D galactose, so of course it's going to have to be coming out of the page towards us, so it's going the same way as the sixth carbon. So this is the picture of the major form of galactose, which is beta D galactose. Again, there are four different forms of galactose, this is the major form. Alpha D galactose, this will be going into the page away from us. Beta L galactose, swap all five of them around. Alpha L galactose, swap these four around, leave this one unchanged. Now, again, to turn galactose into galactose, I mean you go to the second uh, carbon's alcohol group here, you take it off and you replace it with an amino group here. And that turns galactose into galactosamine. Okay, so uh, again, the major form of galactosamine is beta D galactose mean corresponding to the major form of galactose. But again, there will be four different forms of galactose mean which correspond to the four different forms of galactose. So, this is what we mean when we just say galactose mean, beta D galactose mean. So these two molecules that I've got here, these are the two molecules that you can have in this position glycosidically linked to your uronic acid sugar. Okay, fantastic. We're doing brilliantly. We have now seen the four different monosaccharides that you can use to build these disaccharides, which you can then construct your glycosaminoglycan out of. The next thing I need to tell you is that these um, monosaccharides in the glycosaminoglycan can have modifications onto them. This makes the glycosaminoglycans a little bit more exciting. You can put modifications onto the monosaccharides. And there are two different types of modification that you can make. Acetylation of the amino groups of the amino sugars and also sulfonation of um, the alcohol groups and also the amino groups uh, on the uronic acid sugar and the amino sugar. So let's firstly just talk about acetylation. So acetylation means the addition of an acetyl group onto um, the molecule and this only occurs onto the amino group of one of the amino sugars. So let me show this. So here is one of the amino groups here, and then if it's got an acetyl group on, it will have a two carbon carboxylic acid group bound to it by an amide link like so. So this is an acetyl group here. It's the acyl group of an acetic acid molecule bound to the amino sugar. So you can get N acetylation of the amino sugars in your uh, glycosaminoglycan. So this modification is called N acetylation. So that's one of the modifications that you can make now. So uh, saying what I've said in summarising what I've said about the story so far, so you can construct these glycosaminoglycans made out of these polymers of these disaccharides to the amino sugars in this great big glycosaminoglycan, you can acetylate their amino groups, and this is called N-acetylation. So lots of the amino sugars will be N-acetylated in the glycosaminoglycan molecule. The other modification that you can make is slightly more complicated, but it's also slightly more interesting. This is sulfonation, and sulfonation is more interesting because it can occur not only to the amino group, but also to alcohol groups. So you can get, we'll start off with N-sulfation, but then we'll go on to uh, O-sulfation as well. So N-sulfonation, or you can call it N-sulfation. I'm trying, I'm debating what I want to call it now. We'll have N-sulfation, I think. It means the same thing, sulfation, sulfonation. So N-sulfation. So this is the addition of a sulfate, also called a sulfonate group, onto the amino group. So again, here is the amino group here. And then we're now going to have a sulfate group, which consists of a sulfur atom here, double bound to two oxygens, like so, and then with an alcohol group coming off it here. Now that alcohol group may have lost its proton and therefore may just be an oxygen with a negative charge there because 
these sulfate groups, you'll notice they're actually very similar to carboxylic acid groups. If this was a carbon, that would be a carboxylic acid group. And therefore, this actually does function as an acid. The proton can come off. This can be left with a negative charge that can donate protons to solutions. So it will often have lost its proton and have a negative charge here. So this group that you've got added on there, that's a sulfate group, also called a sulfonate group. So sulfate or sulfonate, uh, they're just different names for the same thing. Okay, so this is the group that's important here. So onto the amino sugars, apart from just acetylation, you can also get sulfation or sulfonation. Okay, uh, so that's another modification that can occur to the amino sugars. Sulfation, however, can also occur onto alcohol groups. And this is interesting because it doesn't just now involve the amino sugars, it can also involve the uronic acid sugars. So on the second alcohol group and the third alcohol group of the uronic acid sugars, you can get sulfation occurring. And also on the amino sugars, coming over to the amino sugars, you can get sulfation occurring on the amino group, you can get it occurring on the alcohol group of the third carbon, and you can also get it occurring on the alcohol group of the sixth carbon. So on the amino sugars, you can get sulfation occurring in three places. On the uronic sugars, you can get it occurring in two places in, on these two alcohol groups. So let me now draw O sulfation over here. So I think we'll go to some nice purpley colour for this. Okay, so O sulfation is where the sulfate group is now going to be added on to an alcohol group rather than the amino group this time. So all O sulfation will look like this. Here is the oxygen of the alcohol group, and now you're just going to have the sulfate group bound on here like so. So here's the sulfur with the two oxygens double bound to it, and now I'll actually show the alcohol group with no proton on there. So there's the oxygen with a negative charge. So some of the alcohol groups on sulfate groups will be in this form, and some of them will be in this form. Uh, it will be a dynamic equilibrium. And really, you should understand these bonds very similar to amide and ester links for carboxylic acids. So this is an amide link here where the carboxylic acid group is bound to the amino group. Here, this is very similar to a carboxylic acid. It's just that you've got a sulfur atom there instead of uh, a carbon atom. And these sulfate groups, you can think of them as coming effectively from sulfuric acid, which has this structure here. Sulfur double, ba double bounds to two oxygens and then two alcohol groups coming off it like so. So this is sulfuric acid. And again, the reason it's an acid is because these protons off these alcohol groups can come off. And look at these groups. These are effectively just like carboxylic acid groups. So this is effectively a molecule with two carboxylic acid groups, or just or the equivalent with a sulfur atom there instead of a carbon atom. So these alcohol groups, just like the alcohol group on a carboxylic acid group, they can react with alcohol groups to form effectively an ester link, which is what we've got here, or they can react with an amino group to form effectively an amide link here, but with the sulfur atom rather than a carbon atom. So these are just like how carboxylic acids would react with alcohol and amine groups. Okay, so you can add sulfate groups then onto the amino sugars and the uronic acid sugars in your glycosaminoglycan. And indeed, in heparan sulfate, you will get sulfation of some of the um, monosaccharides in the polysaccharide, hence why it's called heparan sulfate. So I've now given you a great big long discussion of uh, glycosaminoglycans. Let me tell you what the characteristic feature of this glycosaminoglycan, heparan sulfate, actually is. So there are loads of different types of glycosaminoglycan. They have different combinations, different proportions of the different types of disaccharide that you could have in the glycosamino molecule. And in heparan sulfate, the main disaccharide that you have is glucuronic acid, which I'll just abbreviate down to gluc. Actually, no, I'll write it out in full just to be unambiguous. So the major disaccharide that you have is glucuronic acid linked by a glycosidic link to the amino sugar that's been acetylated, N 
acetyl glucosamine. So this is the major type of disaccharide that you have in heparan sulfate. You have glucuronic acid linked to N-acetyl glucosamine. You will have other types of disaccharide in the heparan sulfate molecule, but the major type, if you were to look at most of the disaccharides in the heparan sulfate chain, in a great big heparan sulfate molecule, glycosaminoglycan, you would find mainly this boring old disaccharide. You'd find glucuronic acid linked to N-acetyl glucosamine. Occasionally, you'd have a more interesting one. And this is what gives those heparan sulfate molecules their properties, the fact that they have so many of this disaccharide, and therefore that determines the properties. But you have to understand that Different heparan sulfate molecules will be slightly different because they're not all identical. It's a whole group of molecules that overall are dominated by this disaccharide. Okay, so if you've got a glycosaminoglycan that overall is dominated by this disaccharide, it will be a heparan sulfate glycosaminoglycan and it will have certain properties due to having this disaccharide predominate. And that's why we call it a heparan sulfate glycosaminoglycan. Okay, so you now know what is meant by a heparan sulfate chain or a heparan sulfate polysaccharide. So now let's talk about what is a heparan sulfate proteoglycan. So let's just go over here and do this. So we'll get a fresh colour, we'll go back to blue. So heparan sulfate proteoglycans then HSPGs. These are proteins that have got heparan sulfate chains attached to them. So heparan sulfate proteoglycans, they consist fundamentally of a core protein which has got heparan sulfate chains bound onto it. And there are three different examples of core proteins for heparan sulfate proteoglycans. So some of these are proteins that are going to be on cell surfaces. So, cell surface heparan sulfate proteoglycans, whilst others are going to be uh, proteins that are in the extracellular matrix. And remember, the extracellular matrix is like the cytoskeleton outside of cells. So, remember, in between cells, there isn't just empty space, there isn't just gloop there. Otherwise, the cells would just be floating around in gloop. They wouldn't stay where they were. So, the cytoskeleton keeps cells in the same shape, to keep cells in the same position, the, the stuff that they're in can't just be a gloop. Instead, it has to be have some sort of rigid structure there, and indeed it does. This is called the extracellular matrix, or the ECM for short. So this stands for extracellular, that's the EC, and then the M is for matrix. So there are loads and loads of molecules that are protein molecules and carbohydrate molecules, all over the place, in between cells, a spider's meshwork, a spider's web of um, molecules in between, and those are what keep cells in the same position. And these actually uh, bind through cell surface molecules to components of the cytoskeleton. So it really is, you know, there's a rigid meshwork purveying all the way through the body. Okay, so... Um, Coming back to heparan sulfate proteoglycans then, uh, so we've talked about the fact that these are going to be proteins with heparan sulfate chains bound onto them. Now the core protein is the name for the protein at the center of the heparan sulfate proteoglycan, the one with the heparan sulfate chains bound onto it. Um, and there are two different categories, those that are bound to cell surfaces and those that are in the extracellular matrix. So let's firstly just talk about those that are on the cell surface. So there are two major examples of cell surface core proteins for heparan sulfate proteoglycans, and those are the syndicans, so syndicant proteins, and also the other example is the glypicans. Now, syndicant proteins, there isn't just one syndicant protein, there are multiple syndicant proteins. They are transmembrane proteins. So just drawing a little picture here, here's the phospholipid by there. A syndicant protein would be like so. It's a transmembrane protein going across the membrane, and then to make it into a 
heparan sulfate proteoglycan. At the moment, it's just a protein. To make it into a heparan sulfate proteoglycan, it needs to have heparan sulfate chains bound onto it, like so. And they will be in the extracellular face. So on the extracellular side of the syndicate protein, you'll have these heparan sulfate chains bound onto the protein. So these, in purple here, these are heparan sulfate chains. Now you might ask, well, how long will these heparan sulfate chains be? It can vary. Their size can be between 40 monosaccharides all the way up to 300 monosaccharides generally. And you know, this is just a range. In reality, biology, you know, nowhere in biology does it say that the heparan sulfate chains must be strictly between this range. So they can vary in how um, big the heparan sulfate chains that are bound onto the protein will be. But this is the general figure. So, syndicate proteins then, they are transmembrane proteins that can be made into heparan sulfate proteoglycans and generally they are made into heparan sulfate proteoglycans by having heparan sulfate molecules attached onto them. So this structure that we've now got here, this would be called a syndicate heparan sulfate proteoglycan. So the syndicate is the name for the core protein, the syndicate heparan sulfate proteoglycan is then the protein with the heparan sulfate molecules bound onto it. So I will actually just put its full name here. This is a syndicum heparan sulfate proteoglycan. Now, uh, as I say, there are lots of different syndicate proteins that you can make syndicate heparan sulfate proteoglycans out of. And a major one that we think is important in epithelial cells, specifically in squamous stratified uh, epithelial cells, and therefore might be in the basal cells of the squamous stratified epithelium is syndicon 1. So we think syndicon 1 might be specifically important for um, the uh, HPV binding. Okay, so um, what I mean by that is this protein, syndicon 1, is made by the basal cells in the squamous stratified epithelium. It will end up with heparan sulfate chains bound onto it, just like this picture that I've drawn here. And these will then be on the surface of the basal cells. So on the surface of the basal cells, you have syndicon 1 heparan sulfate proteoglycan. Syndicon 1 is just a specific example of one of these syndicon core proteins. Glipicons are slightly more complicated. Glipicons are not uh, transmembrane proteins like syndicons. They can also be turned into heparan sulfate proteoglycans, but they're not transmembrane proteins. So here is the cell membrane. Glipicons are attached onto special lipid molecules in the outer lipid of the phospholipid bilayer. So here we go. Here is a special lipid molecule in our outer leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, and this is known as a GPI molecule, a glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol molecule. So this thing in purple here is representing a glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol lipid molecule. So this is a special type of lipid molecule that will be present in the lipid bilayer. And lots of proteins, not just glipicans, can be attached to the outer layer of a cell membrane by being attached to these glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol molecules, these GPI molecules, and this is known as GPI anchorage. So let me just pick a fancy color. We'll have yellow here. So here then is the protein bound onto the GPI linkage, and this is how glipicans are bound to the outside of cells. So again, glipicans are a class of proteins. They are not transmembrane proteins, although they are on the outside of cells. So this is the extracellular fluid side here. And they are attached to the membrane by being attached to lipids in the outer leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. And by the way, just in case you don't know, the phospholipid bilayer has two layers of phospholipids. The uh, outer layer is known as the outer leaf, but the inner layer is known as the inner leaf. That, so obviously it's important for the lipid that we want to attach our protein that's going to be on the outer surface of the cell membrane to be in the outer lipid, outer leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. 
So, glycans are a class of proteins that are on the surface of cells and they're attached there by glycosyl phosphatidylinositol molecules and these can be turned into heparan sulfate proteoglycans. So again, they can have heparan sulfate chains attached to them like so and this would now be known as a glycan heparan sulfate proteoglycan. So this is a glycan heparan sulfate proteoglycan. Now, Glipicans are very interesting, however, they're not expressed, we don't think, in the basal cells of squamous stratified epithelium, so they're not terribly relevant to our story. But just for um, background information, glipican heparan sulfate proteoglycans are another form of heparan sulfate proteoglycan. They're specifically important in brain tissue, neural tissue. But we won't mention them again. The syndicans are more important for us in the extracellular matrix, uh, heparan sulfate proteoglycans. So extracellular matrix now, coming on to these. Uh, so a big example is the perlicans. Now, this again is the core protein. Uh, so perlicans are proteins that are members of the extracellular matrix. So they're members of this spider's meshwork in between cells. So I might just draw a little picture of this. So here are two cells. In between the two cells is going to be a spider's meshwork, which we call the extracellular matrix. So I'll put a little bit of this here. So these are fibers in the extracellular matrix. One of the proteins that is present in the extracellular matrix is a protein called well, a, a class of proteins called perlicans. So again, there is not just one perlican, it's a class of proteins. So there are lots of these, lots of different ones, but effectively, they all perform the same function. So these are a component of the extracellular matrix. They link to loads of other components of the extracellular matrix. And one of the ways that they link to so many other components of the extracellular matrix is by having lots of heparan sulfate um, chains coming off them like so. So they're going to have lots of heparan sulfate chains coming off them as well, like this. Uh, and therefore they are also referred to as a heparan sulfate proteoglycan. So this would now be called a perlican heparan sulfate proteoglycan. Okay, so to summarise what we've seen here, Heparan sulfate proteoglycans. The proteoglycan bit refers to the fact that we have both protein and carbohydrate. Proteo refers to protein, glycan refers to carbohydrate. So I'll write it out again, proteoglycan. So these are molecules consisting of both protein and carbohydrate. We have just studied the proteins that are part of these heparan sulfate proteoglycans, and there are two major categories, those that are on the cell surface and those that are in the extracellular matrix. We've done the major two examples of cell surface core proteins, the syndicans and the glipicans, and we've seen a major example of extracellular matrix core proteins of heparan sulfate proteoglycans. To turn these core proteins into heparan sulfate proteoglycans, you have to just link on lots of heparan sulfate chains. So it's very, very simple. The ones that are significant for us are syndicans, specifically this example of syndicon 1. So syndicon 1 we think is highly expressed in the basal cells of squamous stratified epithelia and will have a lot of heparan sulfate molecules attached to it. Uh, so you have syndicon 1 heparan sulfate proteoglycans in the basal cell membranes. Glipicans, we can put a great big cross through them. They're interesting just for background information, but they're not important in our story. The perlicans are going to be really important in our story. I was about to draw a cross through them, but no, they are really important in our story. So perlicans are extracellular matrix proteins that can be turned into heparan sulfate proteoglycans by having loads of heparan sulfate molecules attached to them. And these are present within the basement membrane. So now we can finally come back to our story. We think that the human papillomavirus particles initially bind to the basement membrane by binding to heparan sulfate proteoglycans in the basement membrane. And I've now given you examples of heparan sulfate proteoglycans that will be in the basement membrane. So I might just draw one of them in here. So here is the perlican core protein. Remember, perlican is present in extracellular matrix. The basement membrane is just a special, very uh, dense form of extracellular matrix. Uh, 
So there's the Perdican core protein here, and here are some heparan sulfate uh, chains coming off like so. And we think that the L1 proteins of the viral capsid, so of course this is the viral capsid covered in L1 proteins, we think that they have the ability to bind to parts of the heparan sulfate chains. So we don't think that they are specific for which heparan sulfate proteoglycan they like. They don't care, we don't think, about the core protein. They just care about the heparan sulfate chains that are attached to the core protein. Now, what does that mean? That means that on our basal cell over here, here is our uh, syndicon core protein. So maybe specifically syndicon 1. As I say, the glipicons we don't think are in these basal epithelial cells, uh, but we do think syndicon 1 is there. And again, syndicon 1 will be a heparan sulfate proteoglycan. It will have lots of these heparan sulfate chains on it. So this means that this virus particle, to initially bind, it could either bind on the surface of the cell by binding to cell surface heparan sulfate proteoglycans, or it could bind to the uh, heparan sulfate proteoglycans in the basement membrane. Now, initially, we think it binds to the basement membrane just because probability says it will bind to the basement membrane. It's much more likely to come in to the wound and bang into the basement membrane, and the L1 proteins all over the place will start binding to these heparan sulfate chains of the heparan sulfate proteoglycans in that basement membrane. So you'll get virus particles binding to the basement membrane. Then as the basal cells move over the top of this exposed basement membrane in the healing process, in the regeneration process, they will have heparan sulfate proteoglycans in their cell membranes and they'll have them on the bottom here as well. So as they're moving over, the viruses will then be able to bind to the heparan sulfate proteoglycans in the cell membranes of the basal cells, and therefore they will exchange to being bound onto the basal cells. So just summarizing where we've got to now, we have number one, binding to the basement membrane, and then number two, we have transfer to cell membrane, which I'll just put as plasma membrane. And this occurs as part of the healing process. So when the basal cells are dividing and producing two basal cells so that they can repopulate the basal cell layer of this wounded area, you'll have to get basal cells moving over the top of the basement membrane. And that's when we believe the transfer process occurs. But remember, both of these processes, the way they're binding to the basement membrane and the way they're binding to the cell surface, it's through these magic molecules that we've spent so much time talking about it's through the heparan sulfate proteoglycans, and it's the heparan sulfate that they are binding to, not the core protein. It does not give a damn whether the heparan sulfate is bound to a perlican or a syndican. It's the heparan sulfate chains that the L1 proteins, we believe, are binding to. So that's the initial binding event. That's how it's going to bind to the surface of a cell. We'll have a break here, and in the next video, we'll continue on this fantastic story.